Hello, friends of the Peterborough Diocese. Welcome back. It's good to see you. Uh, you know, you didn't have to come back, but you did. And I, I appreciate that you are here because we're going to continue on, on in our message about the full purpose of our life. Today, we're talking about the topic, Blessings Are Chasing You. In the life of the church during Lent, we are encouraged to place our hearts and minds upon the passion of Jesus Christ. And so today, this is what we're going to do. We are going to contemplate and think about Jesus on the cross because the passion of Jesus proves his passionate love for us. I want you to see that moment in your mind where Jesus is on the cross and he's got people down below him pointing up at him saying, if you are who you say you are, save yourself. Now, the Jewish authorities are taunting Jesus in this moment. I, I find this interesting. If you are who you say you are, save yourself. Press pause here for a second. Who did Jesus say he was? Because I think we're confused about the identity of Jesus Christ in our culture right now. You know, some people say that Jesus was a good man. But you know what? Jesus never claimed to be merely a good man. Some people say that Jesus was a teacher. Yes, it's true that Jesus taught. His, his teachings are very popular. <laughs> but Jesus never claimed to be merely a teacher. Other people say that Jesus maybe was a political leader. And although Jesus got caught up in the political life a little bit, Jesus never claimed to be a political leader. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. What did Jesus claim that would ignite the Jewish authorities to point at, point at him on the cross and say, if you are who you say you are, save yourself. Well, Jesus claimed equality with God. And you might be thinking, Ken, are you sure? How did Jesus claim equality with God? Well, if we look into the scriptures in many different ways, recall when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If anyone wants to go to the Father, they must come through me. See, what Jesus said about himself is unique. It's different than any founder of any world religion. Many of the founders of other world religions pointed to a way, pointed to their teaching, a way of life. But Jesus, yes, he taught, but he pointed to himself as the solution for mankind's problems. He said, I am the way the truth and the life, not my teachings. He didn't say, my teachings are the way, the truth, and the life. I am. The Jewish authorities were picking up on this, and it ticked them off. Why? What's well, blasphemy? There could only be one God, and Jesus, you're not it. So what did they do? They worked the political system. They get Jesus nailed to the cross, and then they throw his God claim right back in his face. If you are who you say you are, God well then, prove it. Save yourself. I think about Lazarus, for example. Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus, who was dead for four days, by the way. He shows up at the tomb, according to Lazarus' sisters, four days too late. Have you ever felt God being late in your life? God, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Now I, I need it yesterday. <laughs> If you ever feel like God is late in your life, it's usually because you're early. Jesus has his way of showing up in our life at exactly the right time. He shows up at the right time at Lazarus' tomb. And what does he do? It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He identified with the pain of the people. Jesus understands your pain right now, today. Whatever you're going through, Jesus enters into the pain of the one he loves, which is you. And he weeps with those who weeps. And I imagine Jesus wiping the tears from his eyes and then says, roll away the stone. And what did they say? Well, Lord, it's, it's going to stink. I mean, they're practical. The guy's been dead for four days. But Jesus insists. And so they go and they push the stone away. And I imagine the stench of the rotting corpse of Lazarus fills the air. 
And while everyone turns their their head away because it stinks so bad, what does Jesus do? He goes right to where it stinks. That's an important lesson for us, friends. There's areas of our life that stink, that aren't perfect, that are broken. Maybe some areas of our life or even have even gone to rot because of the disorders of our appetites and sin. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't turn away from the stench. He doesn't turn away from the brokenness. He doesn't turn away from those dead areas of our lives. No, in fact, the opposite. It's almost like he's attracted to our weakness, attracted to our brokenness, attracted to those areas of our life that have gone dead. He goes right to where it stinks. And what does he do with Lazarus? He calls him by name. Lazarus, come out. Three words that changed Lazarus's life. And with these, these three words, he raises this man from the dead. And so with this in mind, now I want you to go back to the foot of the cross and you hear the Jewish authorities pointing up at Jesus, yelling at him, saying, if you are who you say you are, save yourself. Can't Jesus say another three words? Nails come out. What's easier? To tell nails to move or to raise somebody from the dead? I'm just guessing that after you walked on water, calm storms, multiplied loaves and fish, fed thousands of people, the blind see, the lame walk, telling nails to move would have been your smallest public miracle. So when you look at the cross, you have to conclude it's not nails holding Jesus there, but the power of his love for you. And this changes everything. Because then we realize, oh, God is for us. He's not against us. He wants to bless our life, not mess our life. And when we understand and we get this all important fact that it's not nails holding Jesus at the cross, but the power of his love for us, loving us as though we are the only person in the entire world. That's the nature of God's love for you. He loves you as though you are a universe unto yourself. When we realize it is out of love that he goes there, atoning for our sin, it just changes everything because then we realize, oh, God is trustworthy because who gives their life for somebody else and then yells back to them and says, oh, I hope you have a miserable life. Now, when you love somebody, you want the best for them. God wants the best for you. And what is the best? It's Jesus. It's himself. We are made by God. For God. And who was God? First John 4 8. Love. God is love. So we can also say we are made by love for love. We're made to be in union with the love of God. It's a love relationship that we're made for. And with every relationship, what does it require? It requires consent. It requires a yes. The beautiful thing is that God has done his part now. The rest is up to us. We got to respond. Recall in Revelations 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus Christ stands at the door of our lives and knocks. He doesn't stand there passively. He's actively seeking to draw us to himself. And that door, that knocking, we must answer. He can't force himself into our lives. He can't bust into our life. Love requires consent. The Catechism says, the desire for God is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. Hear this. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. In every circumstance of your life, in the past, the good times that God has blessed and the bad times that maybe God has allowed, what is God doing? He's drawing you to himself in every moment of every day. In other words, blessings are chasing you. God is after your heart. 
Have you allowed yourself to be embraced by him?